Greetings comic lovers and welcome back to Casually Comics, the channel where we chat all things comics, from reviews of comics new and old, to history, to anecdotes, to wherever our whims take us. Today, it's new. Yes, we're in the realm of new, but still off the beaten path. I was sucked in by the pretty cover art. I admit it. Look at this cover. I needed to know. And I've always liked Terry Dodson's art, and he did the cover of this and all of them so far. Only one is released. This is going to be a five-issue miniseries or limited series, which just sounds so much more dire, like you need to run and get it right now. There's limited. There's a limited amount. It doesn't actually mean that. Look at issue two's cover. So much to say. Is Sue mad because Gwenpool is kissing Reed or because she's not kissing her? Also, Reed? Really, Gwen? She's supposed to be a comic book fan. She knows where that mouth has been. If you've ever been drawn in by a comic book cover, hit that like button. Also, we have an Instagram now. It's in the description. Moving on up to the social side. And thank you so much to all the people who've subscribed for this journey here on Casually Comics. Welcome to all the new people and let's just get started. So this is Gwenpool, an interesting and oft times polarizing character. She tends to be much loved or much hated or also with a healthy dash of who? This is because of how she was created, who she was first popular with, and the comic book climate at the time. It was a perfect storm. If you're interested, we can do a deep dive into her history, but for now, let's get to some cliff notes. Gwenpool was first drawn as a variant cover for Deadpool's Secret Secret Wars number no. 2 in 2015, so she's pretty new at the time of this recording. Her design would prove to be very popular amongst the cosplay community, and she would spring up on Instagram and at cons. Marvel was impressed by the fact that a character who didn't even have any comics or backstory was generating such buzz. So they decided to take the leap and introduce her as an actual comic book character. Her basis is very Deadpool-y. She's supposed to be a comic book fan from our universe who has found her way into the comic verse, and her goal is to remain there and be an important character. She is extremely meta and lives or dies based on the author's ability to convey some kind of connection with the audience, and also depending upon how humorous they can be and whether that humor connects. What we're looking at today is a limited series entitled Gwenpool Strikes Back, number one by Leah Williams with art by David Baldion. Star Wars reference. There is a lot of reference humor in this. If that is not your thing, Best get out now. The opening line sets the tone. It will tell you all you need to know. Have you ever looked at a really pregnant lady and had the urge to squeeze her like a tube of toothpaste? <gasps> Wait, am I internal monologuing right now? Does that mean... Then she pops up and tells the reader that it's a Gwenpool solo story. So you know how Deadpool breaks the fourth wall and has lots of references to things that are happening or have happened in our world or in past comic canon? The thing is, he actually doesn't talk to the reader too directly. He's actually stopping, looking right at you, and talking to you. That's done sparingly. It's an accent to his character. Take that and modify it by a hundred and you're only beginning to approach how much Gwenpool will talk to you and break that fourth wall. It's beyond breaking it. She might as well just be sitting beside you. She then proceeds to tell the reader her entire backstory in the form of a YouTube page, because YouTube is hip and so is she. Also, there's some obligatory self-deprecating humor. If you're writing a meta story, then it's gonna be there. Hey, the writer really wants you to know how cool and with it she is. I don't know if you can tell. This is where the book gets aggressively hip, as I like to call it. It's 2019 and it's gonna do all of the cool 2019 things, so get ready. They're all gonna happen in a row. I hope you're up on your meme culture. So these panels include Fortnite dances, including flossing, not seeing enough movement. That wasn't even close to a floss, and I don't care. Snapping instead of clapping, which is also a 2019 thing, not just for beatniks at poetry slams in the 60s, and she dabs out. If you can wade through how much this comic is relating to you, then she does talk about what her function is, or what the author perceives her function to be, in this story at least. And I got mired and stuck here for a while, so let's take a look. But unlike Deadpool, I was pretty much intended to be the subversive, self-aware commentary on Cape Comics as a fan of them myself, sort of like I'm mediating a conversation between fans and creators from the page. So there's a lot to unpack here. Is Gwenpool subversive? Your mileage will actually vary on this. Does she exist to challenge an existing institution, which is what being subversive means if you get down to the nitty gritty? Well, some would say yes, but others would say no, that her existence is a direct result of the institution. Hence, she's supporting it and not subverting it. Or at the very least, is a product of it. Also, is she herself actually a commentary on Cape Crusaders, or is it the comments she makes about them that's the commentary? Because those are both different things. Is her existing as a meta character itself the commentary? It could be. And most importantly, mediating a discussion between fans and creators. This supposedly is a fan herself. Okay, we need to get meta for a minute. 
she started it. So Gwen is a fictional character, not a real comic book fan in a comic book, hence she's at the whims of her creators. So any discussion will come from their experience and relationship with fandom, but it will also be filtered through editors and the institutions where the writer works. It will need to be greenlit and sanctioned, so it's not an unfiltered dialogue between the writer and the fan. And even if it were, you have to ask the question, can a character like this ever speak for all of fandom? Which the answer is no, because fandom is not a monolith. I mean, a character could come close to approximating a majority, but what is that majority? Also because this discussion is coming from a creator and the creator changes, the discussion will change from creator to creator. As especially in the modern era, sometimes character integrity can be thrown by the wayside. It happens. Sometimes a character will just do a 180, especially a new character like Gwenpool. Also, is a discussion like this best served directly or indirectly through the storyline? When one becomes a creator, how does that affect their relationship with fandom? There is a threshold there because as a professional, you have to interact with fans differently and also you see different parts of the industry. Yeah, this is what happened to me. This was page four and I was just stuck here. I stopped reading just to think about all of this stuff. I don't think that's what this panel was intending to do. I think it was just supposed to be relatable. Like, I'm a fan, you're a fan. Striking back. But this is just me. I fall down thought pits at random things. This panel could just be pontificating and not actually be a mission statement at all. Anyway, moving on, but please give me all of your thoughts. I want to hear them. I love hearing them. Back to the story. Gwenpool is robbing a bank. And they did get a laugh out of me for modifying MIA's paper planes to be about squeezing a pregnant lady. She's just getting the money when Spider-Man shows up and she's thrilled to see him. This is what she was waiting for. It wasn't about the money or the bank. It was about getting to see him. He knows her, so he relaxes from criminal mode mode to annoyed mode. What this is, is that Gwenpool is actually on the hunt for radiation. She wants superpowers and she's hoping that Spider-Man can give them to her. She also gets dangerously close to fondling Spider-Man's crotch, so we have a Spidey crotch shot for all those who wanted it. Hey, I'm not here to judge. Last episode, I said that Jason Todd's hair streak looks sexy, so for all of you who want that crotch shot, rock on. She also low-key unmasks him. It's not like on the cover, but it's enough to make him angry. Though the hostages, yes, she has hostages, the pregnant lady was one of them, they didn't see anything. Gwenpool waxes about past continuity for a bit, about how Spidey was already unmasked back in Civil War, that's Civil War 1, and how she unmasked Miles Morales once. She then does some reference humor to an awkward yearbook picture, which she just has with her and pulls out to show to Spidey. The picture did get a chuckle out of me. A chortle. However, she then says to him, and I quote, I'm like the S. Frank of cringe culture. It's a gift, honestly. Hold on, hold on, let me, let me redo that. I'm like the S rank of cringe culture, it's a gift, honestly. For those who need that decoded, S rank is a gamer thing because ranking things is really hot right now and gamer culture and lingo is hot right now, even if gamers themselves are not. This is what I mean when I say that this book is being aggressively hip. Imagine how this is gonna read in five or 10 years time. Also imagine what it's like reading it right now and just not being up on the memes. Not everybody who enjoys comic books or nerd culture is up on every single meme or a part of all nerd culture. That's something that the Big Bang Theory did a really big disservice with. Oh, two bigs, almost a pun, but not really. That being that it made it seem that if you're a nerd, you just like all nerd things consistently, equally, all the time, and that's just not the case. In short, this is gonna relate to a specific crowd and other people are actually going to cringe. Are you cringing? Is it good cringe or bad cringe? There is such a thing as good cringing. So the reason that she was looking for Spider-Man specifically was that she wanted him to bite her so that she would then be irradiated. Even though as a comic book fan, a super fan, she should know that that's not how his powers work. And she does, she even admits that she knows that that's not going to happen. But with Gwenpool, sometimes what she knows or doesn't know is waylaid for the joke. So whether or not this lands for you will depend on whether or not you think the joke is funny. Spider-Man is having none of it and he webs her up and leaves her there for the cops. As she lays there pondering just what exactly has gone wrong and how she can get some powers, she's suddenly approached by a sick, literally sick, version of herself. Crawling over, telling her about how bananas are radioactive and if you eat enough of them, maybe you too can be radioactive. Gwen doesn't question this. She trades places with this sick Gwen and runs for her white space. This is the area where she normally hangs out. It's the space in between pages. Her special ability, when she has it, is that she can inhabit this white space. Normally the white space shows her history, but when she gets there this time, it's all messed up. It's falling into a whirlpool, it's disintegrating, and she panics. She realizes that potentially she could be retconned out of existence and ponders why would anybody try so hard to erase her? When has anybody tried this hard? To which I say again, Gwen, you're a super fan. You also reference DC characters all the time, so you know this is a thing. 
Wally West anyone? Sitting in her space, Gwen ponders how to save herself, maybe by joining a team book as a wild card, and working her way up to being solo again. When suddenly she discovers that she has a new ability, she can manipulate the reality of anything that happens off panel. This means she can flash back to things that never happened and make it so that they did. Whether or not you will enjoy this series is going to ride or die on what you think of this concept. For some, they're going to address this as fanfic -y and use fanfic -y in the negative way that people who use it tend to, which also belies a lack of exploration to transformative fandom, which is richer, deeper, and much more of a tapestry than most people understand or know. There is good fan fiction and bad fan fiction, though colloquially most people tend to associate it with unprofessional, which again is not true. So many of them have been taken and turned into novels, but I digress. That's a whole other topic and not just Fifty Shades ones you don't even know about. So it's quite obvious that this is going to be used comedically, and we'll see how it pans out. It has the potential to be really funny. There are four issues for it to be used. She uses the power to try to irradiate herself and becomes the sick one who saved herself mid-issue. And then the issue just ends abruptly. It's over. See you next time. This issue for me was at its best when Gwenpool was interacting with the world and her weird subspace, rather than talking at the reader directly, which for me was a very forced relatability. Aggressively hip. Imagine it, but with 90s slang. Aw oh, snap, I can't believe they did that, what even? Still, there are some for whom this is going to be perfect and for whom that kind of stuff doesn't bother them at all. It's a very niche pet peeve, I know. For a limited series romp full of unconnected zany that's not going to massively alter anything in the Marvel Universe except potentially having Gwenpool stick around, it could be fun. I got some smiles out of it, it earned some chuckles. Dab. Woo, moving up the ranks of cringe culture. It was a cringe. You feel yourself shriveling in on yourself. Gwen is one of those characters where people often talk about her more than the work she's in. Heck, I even did that here. She's just that kind of character. And that can be a positive or a negative, depending upon how you look at it. However, when you take this issue as a whole, not a lot happened. Most of it was spent telling the reader who Pool was, which is great for newcomers, but that took up a lot of time. And the rest of it was justifying the existence of this limited miniseries. But given fans' past reactions to Gwen Pool, that's understandable. The meat will come later, and she better make out with Mr. Fantastic. That had better not be cover bait, click bait. I will be so disappointed. Don't do that to me. I need this. Actually retcon that. I'll accept if it's slightly bait, like how this cover was, but it better not be an outright lie. Gwenpool always puts me in a bit of a ponderous space, so I have a hard time just sitting back and letting it wash over me. What's the case for you? Tell me your experiences with Gwenpool down below. Or if this is your first time, what do you think? Does it seem like something you'd enjoy? I have to say though, her design is great and I love this cover. I want this cover as a poster on my wall. Do you need to know more about Gwenpool's origins? I'll go there. You know I love a mess. I'm Sasha, and thanks so much for watching Casually Comics. Please do all of the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit that bell notification so that you never miss a vid. And I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.